All right, hello class, and welcome to lecture two. In the previous lecture, we discussed the model, uh, how over 2,000 years of history, the complex observations that people observed in the night sky, the motions of the planets as observed through the zodiac and so forth, culminated in first Kepler's three laws of planetary motion, which dramatically simplified what seemed a very complex set of motions into something relatively simple, elliptic motion and equal areas and equal time. After Kepler, Newton in a way simplified the motion even further and said, well, this is simply a result of force equals ma, f equals ma, right? Where the force is the force of universal gravitation, right? Um, the product of the two masses divided by the distance between them squared. So a single equation which, from which you can derive Kepler's three laws of planetary motion. As we'll learn in this lecture, however, the F equals ma, the law of universal gravitation, is actually gives rise to, well, it gives rise to all, really, motion of heavenly bodies, the planets, asteroids, comets, spacecraft, and so forth. And really, it, it, it defines a, a very complex set of motions. Um, and so it, it's going to take a while for us to get from Newton's law of universal gravitation to something which is actually simpler in a certain sense, which is Kepler's three laws. So if you think about this, the, the planets, as it appears over 2,000 years, have again, a relatively complex set of motions. So if you remember, I just cut and pasted this uh, image from the previous lecture. Uh, this is the motion of, what is it, Mercury uh, through the zodiac, right? And you see, it does not look simple, right? The motion is going forward, right, then backwards, then around here, then does a loop-de-loop -loop and continues on its way. And of course, it's even more complicated than that because, right, the, uh, uh, the, the celestial sphere, if you will, the, the stars and the, the sun are in motion around the Earth, and the motion, the Earth is actually rotating, and that makes things even more complicated because your position uh, on the Earth is changing over time as well. Okay. So there's actually lots of motion going on here, and if you, particular, if you think of what's, what are the what are the things which are changing over time, right? Well, there's uh, the position of Mercury, the absolute position of Mercury, if you will, uh, with respect to the Sun. And that's a position vector, varies with time, it has three components, X, Y, and Z, right? So that's changing over time. Well, that's not the only thing that's changing over time, right? The planets, according to Kepler's second law, speed up and slow down, so uh, you have the, p the velocity of Mercury is changing over time. Uh, call it U, V, and W, right? Three velocities, three positions, all changing over time. And, of course, uh, Mercury is not the only planet out there, right? There's uh, all those other planets out there. And then there's the, uh, the motion and velocity and position of Earth as well, where we're making our observation, and that changes with time. So we can say position of Earth and velocity of Earth, right? So really this, uh, this simple motion of Mercury, this periodic motion, which we think of very simply as an ellipse moving around the sun, right? Actually has lots of variables in it from our perspective at least. And so really Newton's law of universal gravitation gives rise to very complex motions. So complex, in fact, that in order to get back to Kepler's second law is going to take us two lectures. Uh, so this first lecture is 
looking for invariance of these mo this motion, right? Things, way, things that aren't changing with time. So the question, of course, is, 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 is the, the orbit of Mercury actually very complicated? Is it actually, are all these things changing over time? And of course, in a certain sense, they are, right? The positions and the velocities are all constantly changing over time, right? But in a certain sense, they're not, because, right, the motion of Mercury is periodic over one year, one Mercurian, Mercurian year. It will come back to exactly where it started, well, more or less. Um, we'll, we can talk about that later. But more or less, a first approximation, it returns back to where it started. So actually, the motion of the Mercury, you can argue, also doesn't change at all, right? It, it's very constant. And the only thing that changes is the time, time of year. I mean, that's periodic. It changes over one Mercurian year from there to there. So uh, in one year, you'll, you'll know exactly where Mercury is. It'll be exactly the same spot, and the velocity will be exactly the same as it was one year ago. Right. So in some sense, these position, the, there are lots of variables here which are constantly changing over time. And in some sense, there's very little that's changing over time. Right? The orbit is constant. And the, uh, where it will be in one year is constant. Right? So almost nothing changes in that sense. Right? So in this lecture, we're going to be trying to take this law of universal gravitation and simplify... Uh, simplify it to find the things which don't change in time and figure out, well, if anything is changing in time, obviously something is changing in time, uh, but not much, right? So we're going to try and figure out how many things are actually changing as a function of time by figuring out the things which aren't changing as a function of time. So that's our goal. So this lecture is broken down into a couple different parts. Uh, the first part, part A, which we're going to be, which we're doing right now, uh, is the uh, are the invariants for the n-body problem. So this is the case where we have not just uh, one planet, but perhaps many of them, or in particular, say for example, the uh, the Earth-Moon system or an Earth satellite system. Um, or uh, maybe even a galaxy with thousands or millions or billions of stars, depending on your perspective. Right? So the two-body problem is you just have Earth or something, a planet rotating around the sun. And then the n-body problem is maybe you have some other planets nearby, and they all exert a gravitational force. So maybe we have the moon over here that's exerting a gravitational force on the Earth, and the Earth is exerting a gravitational force on the moon. And maybe we have a rocket over here, and well, the, and presumably the rocket doesn't exert much force on the Earth, but in principle it could. Uh, but the Earth influences the, the rocket, and the moon influences the rocket, and the sun influences the rocket. So lots of different bodies going on here, right? So at least four in this little diagram right here. So in the first part of the lecture, we'll consider the n-body problem, where we don't know how many bodies there are in the solar system, I guess. If you just think of the planets and the sun, there's 10, uh, but there could be many more in the case of like a galaxy or something like that. Right. So we'll go through the n-body problem. We'll pull out all of the invariants, all the things that don't change with time that we can. Obviously, it's not going to reduce our number of variables as much as it will in the two-body problem, but it, there's at least some order to that, to that chaos. Uh, so in particular, we're going to focus on linear momentum, which is certainly the easiest, because if you remember, uh, I mean, the solar system, we, I didn't mention it on the previous slide, but the, not only are the position and velocities changing, but the position and velocity of the sun itself is changing. We don't observe that so much, but it is in fact changing as well. And our sun of time, and of course the velocity of the sun is a function of is it has a function of time as well. Uh, so linear momentum. Uh, then we'll talk about uh, angular momentum. Uh, so uh, if you've taken a course on rotating bodies or uh, things like that, then you you may be familiar with the concept of angular momentum. We'll certainly cover it at the end of this class as, again. Here we're not talking, however, about rigid uh, bodies. We're talking about bodies which, uh, where the particles move all over the place. Uh, and then finally, our last invariant will be energy. Right? 
So three sets of invariants, which we'll talk about in this part of the lecture. Uh, then we'll come back and focus specifically on the two-body problem, and then for the rest of the class, we'll actually be focusing only on the two-body problem. But of course, our conclusions for the n-body problem also apply to the two-body problem. So definitely need to pay attention to it. And we'll uh, be able to, we'll show that just based on these invariants, we can work some simple problems like escape velocity and so forth. Right. So this, uh, from the book, right, this, uh, this material that we're covering in this lecture covers approximately sections 1.2 to 1.4 Prossing and Conway. Um, in the next lecture, we will go a little bit further. We'll translate these sort of physical, physics-based invariants to geometric invariants. Uh, so that'll be sort of a theme of the course. We'll be relating uh, physics, uh, so angular momentum, energy, to geometric invariants of the orbits, namely the orbital elements, A, E, I, omega, big omega, true anomaly. And then uh, we also have uh, conversions between that and position vectors, position and velocity, what we were talking about there just a second ago. At the end of the sequence of lectures, then, we should be able to convert back and forth between all of these things, between position and velocity to the orbital elements, the geometric, invariant, geometric invariants, uh, to the physical invariants, and uh, back and forth. So let's concentrate now, of course, on uh, the physical invariants. So here's our model of universal gravitation due to Newton. Well, more or less. I'm not sure that Newton was as familiar with vectors and cross products and so on and so forth as we are now, but, uh, but this is uh, the model that we can infer from Newton. Uh, so this is universal gravitation. And it's worth uh, explaining or spending a minute uh, thinking about this model in vector form. So we sort of talked about it in scalar form. Uh, now we're in three-dimensional space. So we have to make everything a vector. So if you remember sort of the form of universal gravitation, it was uh, the universal gravitational constant times the product of the masses divided by the square of the distance between them. Squared. Now, however, our force, we want it to be a vector. This is just magnitude, and so we need it to be a vector. So there's a couple uh, things we have to do, right? Obviously, uh, these parts come follow directly. Um, however, uh, you might notice here that this has a, a cube on the bottom, and this has a square on the bottom. So that's, that's one thing. Uh, so what are, what, are these, what are these numbers which I, I wrote down? Uh, so R12 this R12 here, is the vector uh, from, um, of, 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 of body one with respect, uh, body two with respect to body one. Right. So if this, is, uh, this is the position vector of body one, right. then R12 is the position vector of body one, body two, this is position vector of body two, relative to body one. So we subtract off the position of body one. So that gives us this vector right here. Right. So in absolute space, of course, we translate that origin back to here. And that's, that's why we subtract off that position vector. Right. So this is uh, R12. So that's the uh, vector which points from body one to body two, right? So then the force, uh, right, exerted uh, by, um, uh, exert felt by body one, right, is, well, the magnitude of that force is uh, this constant divided by the distance squared but right we need a direction as well and so we the direction is r12 that's the direction uh, divided by the magnitude of I don't know why I did two bars there 
divided by the magnitude of R12. Right? So that's where we get the cube, right? So this comes over here and becomes a cube. So this is just a, a, direct, a, a unit direction vector. So it just gives the direction of that force. And likewise, of course, the uh, uh, force on uh, body two is the same, G M1, M2, because, right, it's the same two masses, so equal and opposite reaction happening there, uh, divided by R1, R2, 1, cubed uh, R2, 1. Uh, now, it's a very important to note, of course, that the magnitude of R2, 1 is equal to the magnitude of R2, 1, 2. And moreover, uh, it's also important to note that R21, that vector, is just equal to the negative of R12, right? Because equal and opposite, right? And that's easy to see, right? Because it's just equal to R1 vector minus R2 vector, which is equal to the negative of R2 vector minus R1 vector. So a uh, very important relationship, equal and opposite. So the magnitude is equal, the direction is opposite. So universal gravitation there. Right. So there's our force. And now let's combine that with F equals MA. Right. This is MA. This is the acceleration of body one uh, in the, some absolute reference frame. So this is the position of, let's say, this body one, and this is body two. All right, so F e, the acceleration of body one is the force exerted on body one, right, MA. Uh, of course, you can divide by M1 if you like, and then you get the acceleration is equal to, we can just scratch that term off if we like. Right. The acceleration on body one is proportional to this universal gravitational constant times the mass of body two, and the direction to body two, divided by the cube there. One of those is, of course, for normalization. Right. So as I mentioned, right, the uh, relative uh, position of body two with respect to body one is R12, that's how it's denoted. Uh, as we mentioned on the previous slide, uh, equal and opposite, so R12 equals negative of R21. Vectors are reversed. Uh, likewise, as I mentioned before, we can also do F equals MA for body 2 as well. Right? So uh, mass of body 2, force on body 2, same magnitude, opposite direction. So this is the two-body motion. I don't want to get too tied down on two-body motion because in the next uh, 10 slides or so, we're going to be talking about n body motion, so we'll add some more bodies over here as well. I just I didn't add them yet to make life less complicated. Uh, M3. Right. So we have forces exerting all over the place here now. Um, however, we can already do a little bit of simplification, at least in the two body problem, right? just to, uh, to, to illustrate. Um, so if we look at this equation, right, this, these two equations, really, let me erase a little bit there. So if we look at these two equations, equation one, equation two, how complicated is this motion? Well, we have two differential equations. Well, that's to make it sound, that sounds pretty easy, two, two differential equations, two ODEs. Ordinary differential equations. Ordinary in that they're not so ordinary, but they just they don't have spatial derivatives and things like that. So they're nonlinear though, and nonlinear ordinary differential equations, which makes them life a little bit harder. Uh, they're nonlinear because there's this uh, the the variable uh, of motion, the change, right, uh, is in the denominator. Right, there, there's a term here in the denominator that's a nonlinear term. Um. So, but besides the fact that they're nonlinear, right, they're actually more complicated than they appear. Uh, so as I mentioned earlier, right, there are actually 
six things for each position, e each body, which are changing over time. Uh, so in particular, position and velocity are both changing over time, which are, we think of those as separate states, position and velocity, r and r dot. Um, so that's, that's the first thing, the two things that are changing over time. Of course, acceleration is changing over time, but we don't usually count that as a state. Um, but moreover, these are, remember, vector-valued things. So in fact, each body has three components of position and three components of velocity. So in fact, for each of these equations, really, when we simplify it down to first-order systems, we get six differential equations for each of these simple equations here. So six equations here, and six more equations for our second set of, uh, our second equation here, six more equations. So really there are in fact 12 variables here, and uh, moreover these differential equations are nonlinear, which makes them hard to analyze. So this is the chaos, right? This is the fact, and of course if you added n bodies, there would be, uh, right, um, n times uh, 6n equations, right? So life is very getting very complicated very quickly, in fact. Right? Uh, of course, you can simulate these things numerically now with computers. You can simulate them out as long as you like, with some error, of course. The simulations aren't perfect, and in fact, people try and simulate the solar system out to a few billion years, but, you know, uh, those simulations are pretty inaccurate. Um, people are always trying to determine if, like, the solar system is going to kick out another planet or something. Uh, the question is whether the solar system is actually stable or not, because it's not clear, actually, whether we'll lose a planet at some point or not. Uh, who knows? But they try and predict it out by simulating these equations forward in time. Uh, that's not a, our goal, however. We, we, that, we can't do much with these equations. They're, they're too complicated. And so our goal is to simplify them. Well, in the two-body problem, we can simplify them a bit by uh, only considering relative motion. We'll come back to that when we consider the two-body problem. Uh, so in particular, right, if we, d again, go back here and divide both terms by m1, you can scratch m1 out of there. You can scratch divided by m2, scratch m2 out of there. And if we look at the acceleration of r12, that's the relative position three-dimensional, but relative position of R1 and R2, right, then that's R1, R, sorry, R2 double dot, that's triple dot, R2 double dot minus R1 double dot, get my little vectors in there, and if we now add those two things up, well, what do we see here? Um, we get uh, GM1, R21 over R21 magnitude cubed minus GM2 R12 uh, over magnitude cubed R12. But remember, these things are equal to each other, and these things are equal in magnitude but opposite. So we can actually swap that R21 for equals to negative R12 vector. And this one, this magnitude is just equal to R12 cubed. And so we can simplify this out. Just uh, write the whole equation again. Uh, group our common factors equals G over R1, R12 cubed. Uh, and then we have M1. Well, uh, let me let me simplify this. This is negative, so the negatives here cancel, and we get m1 plus m2, and then the uh, another common factor is this r12, r12 here. So we have a uh, if we're just looking at the relative position of these two vectors, we have a single set of equations here. So we can actually simplify already the motion down to uh, six differential equations, or six states. Uh, specifically, in this case, we have R12, uh, three, three components there, and the velocity R12 dot. 
six components there, or three components there. So for two-body motion, at least, we can uh, simplify the, the, the motion down a little bit and get only six diff ordinary differential equations. Still a big mess and still not tractable. But it's important to keep in mind that number six when we come back to two-body motion because that's how many things are really changing over time. Um, through six variables. And in fact, a big focus will be to show that, in fact, we have five invariants. Um, so in fact, there's only one thing which is changing over time. So we'll come back to that when we talk about two-body motion. Yeah. Uh, incidentally, uh, if you're interested, the gravitational constant of the universe is approximately 6.674 times 10 to the negative 11th. Uh, get your units right as well. You might notice that. Um, we'll talk more about the gravitational constant of the universe when we come back to it. So, uh, let's organize the chaos as best we can with n bodies, right? It's not going to be perfect, right? There's still a lot of motion going on with the n-body system, but we can at least pull out several invariants. So what are those invariants? So again, right, the uh, n-body problem des describes lots of important problems. For example, the solar system is a 10-body problem, more or less. We've got the moons. We can add those in as well, but they don't contribute a whole lot gravitationally. Uh, of course, uh, galaxies have, are, are really the true end-body problem. We'll talk about galaxies. And then, of course, the Earth-Moon Earth system, Earth-Moon-Sun system, if you like, because actually that would be a better approximation. Uh, and then we have a spacecraft there, so a four-body problem or a three-body problem, depending on how you, you view it. In any case, uh, so what's our what's our layout here? Let's like get rid of the solar set or get rid of the Earth and Moon here. Uh, so we've got uh, an origin. We've got uh, bodies, uh, n of them, right? Actually, there was a good uh, a good. Uh, let's see if I can just erase this stuff and pull this caption this figure here. Right. Let me just pull that figure off. Board. And I'll just uh, paste it right here, make it a little bit smaller. Right, there we go. Uh, I think, uh, yeah, okay, good. So here we've got the origin. We've got uh, three bodies uh, are depicted here. Um, and if we just look at uh, the force on mass I, force on mass i, which is of course equal to the mass i times uh, the acceleration of the position of mass i with respect to some sort of universal coordinate system, which we don't know. Um, of course, what is that force? Well, that's the sum of the forces from mass j and mass k and mass l and mass, I don't know, q or whatever. We're going to run out of letters essentially, uh, eventually. But uh, it, it's the individual contributions of all of those gravitational uh, forces. Right? So the force on mass I is the sum of all of those other bodies. Where What is that force? Well, the universal gravitation is this constant is the same in all cases. Uh, the sum over J, those are all the other forces, or K, right? whatever your index is and bodies. Uh, the force, uh, actually I can pull out mi here, right, if I liked. Ah, oh. Can I undo that? There, okay, good. Uh, apparently my erase is a little bit too much, uh, too, too serious there. Uh, G times mi, I'll leave mi in there then. Uh, times the product of mi and the mass of j and then divided by the cube of the distance from r to j, and then the vector uh, from i uh, to j. Okay. So that vector here, uh, where, yeah, there's rij. 
So it's, the force is directed towards mass j. It's a vector in each case. Uh, and it's just the sum of the contributions to each of those individual forces. Okay. So this is, uh, again, we have uh, the number of uh, variables are 6n or 3n, depending. There's a number of equations. is 3n. The number of variables is really 6n. Um, and so a lot of equations. So how do we, how do we get any, uh, any order from this chaos? Well, the first point to uh, observe is the conservation of uh, momentum. Uh, so specifically, that'll give us six invariants. So we'll talk about that in a second. So to do to to get linear momentum, uh, what we're going to do is define a fictitious point in space, which is the center of mass of these particles. So the center of mass, of course, is the uh, average weighted average of the position vectors of all of these particles. R one r2 and r3 we just got three here right so the weighted average which means of course it's the sum of the of those um, position vectors so I'll just write it out uh, r1 plus r2 plus r3 uh, divided by the number of uh, of, of items, so in this case three, so divided by uh, the number of items, uh, but it's the weighted um, average. So instead of just adding these up and dividing by the number, we actually weight them by their relative masses. So mass one gets a weight mass one, uh, this gets a weight mass two, and this gets a weight mass three. And so divided by the sum of the total weights, which instead of just three is now m1 plus m2 plus m3. So that's the center of mass. That's our definition for the center of mass. And extending it out to n bodies, it's just the sum of these weights times the position vectors divided by the total mass of the system. Right? So this is our center of mass. So our first observation will be to prove, actually, that the this center of mass uh, doesn't change. Uh, well, it, it changes, but it doesn't accelerate. That's what I should say. Um, so it defines an inertial coordinate system specifically. So as I mentioned earlier, right, uh, we need to keep in mind that these forces are equal and opposite. So Rij equals negative Rji. So if we then look at the acceleration of the center of mass, so here I'll like go back and uh, write the definition of the center of mass. So if we differentiate that with time twice, right? Well, masses don't change in time. Uh, masses don't change. The only thing that changes in time is uh, the position vector itself and uh, position vectors itself. And so we can move that time derivative directly over to the position vectors. And that's what we've done here in the first equation. Right, so we've, uh, the acceleration of the center of mass is the weighted sum of the accelerations of all of the individual masses. Okay. So now what we do is we plug in here our expression for our i. So let's see, where do I have the, that expression here? So scratch that, do my m, scratch m i. And then we'll just take a snapshot of that. And paste it here for reference. Let's see, where should we paste it? Let's paste it right there. Uh, no, let's paste it. I don't know. We'll paste it over here. <clears throat> so now when we plug this expression in for here, right, uh, we already have mass i there. Uh, and so we get a second summation. We get this sum of j equals 1 to n. The mi is already there, uh, so that swaps in for that mi. And there we get the mj and rij terms and the ri cube terms. And then we have the, uh, the gravitational constant popping out right there. 
and we divide the sum of the masses is already there. So now we have a sum over these terms here. And what's interesting, of course, right, is that they equal to zero. Why do they equal to zero? Um, so the, the reason they're e they equal to zero is if we look at the summation, right? So we're summing over i and we're summing over j. Right? So in that summation, we have every value of i and every value of j, where i does not equal to j because masses don't exert forces on themselves. Uh, well, they, I guess they do, but then this would be zero. Anyway, that's a complicated question. Uh, but in any case, well, the important part is for every term mi, mj, rij, in this expression, there's an other term mj, mi, rji, in this expression. And of course, so for every one of these, there's a one of these, one to one. And so if we express this, well, right, we just reorder the mi and mj. And then rji is, of course, equal to negative of rij. And so we get rij and a little negative sign. So when we add each of these two pairs, right, this cancels equal to, it cancels that term. And every term in it, in this entire expression gets canceled by its pair. And so when we sum them all up, we get a sum of zeros, and which is of course equal to zero in the end. So that tells us then that the acceleration of the center of mass of this system is equal to zero. So that will give us right off, if we integrate that expression, uh, two invariants of motion two constants but don't change to over time. Well, what is the integral of zero? What's the double integral of zero? Well, it's just, of course, a constant, right? So the integral, double integral of zero. Well, a single integral of zero is a constant, uh, C1. And then the double integral of that constant is equal to C1 times T plus C2. And remember, these are vectors. This is a vector valued uh, equation. And so we have here that the position of the center of mass is entirely determined. We have an explicit expression for it. So in particular, it's expressed as a constant. So there's an origin or an initial condition, if you will, and a vector path, right, uh, which is followed linearly in time. So the center of mass then has some initial condition, C0, or C1, I guess, or C2, right? And some initial velocity, uh, which, it, which doesn't change. Right. So six invariants. The position is invariant, the initial position is invariant, and the velocity is invariant of the center of mass. So entirely predictable. Although, right, all of these little masses are going to be flying around the center of mass, we have already six invariants in the system corresponding to the center of mass and its velocity. So six invariants. You can think of this as uh, momentum, right, linear momentum. So specifically uh, that uh, uh, expression here for C1 is the, uh, is the momentum of the system. And of course, it'll keep moving in that, in that direction. So momentum is conserved in the end body problem, or the center of mass. So technically, the, the, so the motion of the center of mass doesn't change with time. And so we can actually use that uh, to say that the center of mass defines an inertial coordinate system. because it's moving under inertia, right? There's no uh, violation of inertia in this coordinate system. So for example, right, when we think of the solar system, right, the sun, right, is moving with respect to the, in the solar system, or in the, in the galaxy, right? So there's a black hole at the center of our galaxy, and we're in like the distant wing of one of the arms of this Milky Way galaxy. Here's like the arms of the Milky Way galaxy, sorry, that Milky Way galaxy. And of course, the sun is moving around that center of the Milky Way galaxy, center of massive Milky Way galaxy. But that doesn't seem to affect our motion very much. 
uh, because more or less the, the, the sun is, is a center of mass of the solar system. Of course, the sol center of mass of the solar system is a little bit outside the sun. Uh, actually, I'm not sure it's actually the surface of the sun. It probably is. But that difference doesn't make a whole lot of difference to us from describing the planetary motion. Okay. So, uh, when we talk then about our two-body problem or our n-body problem, we'll you be using the center of mass of the n-body problem or the two-body problem as our origin. Um, now I'm talking about n-body problems and I should, I, I'll make a brief mention of a chapter in Pressing and Conway which we are not going to cover which is chapter 4 and that's the three-body problem actually it's a restricted three-body problem that's the case where we have an Earth, we have a Moon and we have a spacecraft which where the spacecraft doesn't actually uh, exert a significant gravitational force. Um, but this is the case where we have two for actually they're going the wrong way. The forces force one and force two. Um, and then of course the, the two restricted three body problem gives rise to all sorts of interesting things like Lagrange points and, uh, and uh, motion around the earth and the moon. But again, uh, we're not going to consider it in this course just because well, actually, it's actually rather complicated, the stability of the Lagrange points. You not only have to account for gravitational force, but the rotating nature of the coordinate system, and it makes, makes life a mess. So we're just going to breeze over it. Okay. So that was the easy one, and uh, linear momentum. Linear momentum is conserved. So we already have six invariants, so that's good. Um, the harder ones are angular momentum and energy. So we're going to do angular momentum first. So conservation of angular momentum, you're used to that, right? Uh, it's sort of a, linear, a special case of linear momentum in the case of rigid bodies. Right? So rigid body meaning like, uh, say, uh, a barbell right, in space. Right? It, it has an angular momentum. It's rotating. Right? And that angular momentum is conserved. Right? We, you've probably seen it in a normal dynamics class. In our case, however, uh, it's not so simple. Our bodies are not rigid. There's no rigid connection between these two bodies. Uh, so we have to actually prove conservation of angular momentum a little bit more carefully. Okay. Um, so how do we do that? So we're going to do it for n-body problem, right? Angular momentum is conserved in the n-body problem. Uh, so the first step is, of course, to define what we mean by angular momentum. And this is a, con a normal definition that we're... we're familiar with from rigid body dynamics, which is the sum of the position cross velocity. So if you have a, sort of a center of mass or a, a coordinate system, then we're used to thinking about the angular momentum of a particle as its position vector crossed its velocity vector. Right? So h equals r cross phi. We're, we're familiar with that concept, hopefully. Uh, so we extend that to n individual masses uh, by uh, taking the uh, position vector of that mass. So here now we've got our center of our coordinate system, and we've got maybe two masses. They're each going opposite. I don't know. It R2, uh, V2. And of course, uh, V2 is R2 dot. So uh, the individual contributions to those angular momentums are just summed up, right? So we have the sum of, and now we weight, of course, by, by mass as well. As well. Um, the position vectors cross the velocity vectors. So we can think of that as vi. Now, <clears throat> I should mention at this point that we've introduced a little bit of new notational technology, uh, which is a cross product. To be not to be confused with multiplication. Now I'm sure you've all seen cross products before. But it's worth mentioning a few things about them. So first of all, right, um, right hand rule, right, 
cross products, uh, obey the right hand rule. Uh, R cross V, right? Two dimensional plane. And then the product, cross product of those two vectors uh, points in the third direction. You can see that. So R, V, right hand rule. Use your right hand to get the direction of the third vector, right, coming out, pointing towards me. Um, cross products do not obey all of the properties of regular multiplication products. Uh, it, they do form an algebra in that they define like a multipli an, a, a abstract multiplication, but they don't obey all of the rules that multiplication does. Uh, in particular, they don't have the associative property. Right. Um, so that becomes important. So for example, uh, R cross V uh, is equal to the negative of V cross R, right? Uh, there's also some other properties which will, when, when they come up, we'll talk about a little bit. Um, but generally speaking, you have to be careful in which products, which properties you apply to the cross product because you can't just like apply any of them. Fortunately, they actually do obey the distributive property, which is that, um, uh, let's see, R cross V1 plus V2 is equal to R cross V1 plus R cross V2. So that, that's, a bond. That, that's a good thing. Right? We'll use that quite a bit. All right, so let's, uh, let's look then at angular momentum. So this is our definition for angular momentum. Get rid of all this rubbish. Um, and of course, what we want to show is that angular momentum is conserved, so we're going to show that its derivative is zero. And so how do we show that? Right, well, okay, so we take the derivative of it, right? DDT of this expression, right? Uh, so specifically, if we apply that to this expression, um, well, one thing that cross products do obey is the chain rule of differentiation. So in particular, if you take the derivative of R cross V, V, T, right? Uh, the result is R dot cross V plus R cross V dot, right? So chain rule, right? So that's helpful. So this is, that's all we've done here is we've expanded this expression, the derivative of this expression out in the chain rule. Um, so what do we have now? Um, we have R dot cross R dot. That's the first one, uh, and that's the notice that the indices are the same here, right? There's no double index yet, right? This is all i. So we have r dot cross r dot. So that's a good thing to have because any the first thing to note is of course that anything crossed with itself is zero, right? Uh, you can just see that with the with the uh, um, well, okay. So actually, maybe uh, I think we have expression here. Nice. Uh, remember this rule for cross products. Um, so the R cross V is the magnitude of R cross the magnet times the magnitude of V times the angle between those two vectors, right? So R V, right, uh, is the magnitude of R cross times the magnitude of V times the sine of the angle between them. And that's the important one because if there's, if they're the same vector, then the angle between them is zero and so sine of zero is zero, right? So then, uh, eight, so that implies, of course, that R cross R, or actually in our case, V cross V is zero, right? Because there's no angle between V and V, it's zero. Uh, and then there's the, the direction as well, uh, and that's the unit vector perpendicular to those two vectors. So N hat. So R, V, uh, and then N is the one perpendicular to that. <clears throat> so this term, right, because it's v cross v, that's just zero. Uh, and so we get 
this slightly simpler expression right here, which is R I cross R A dot, essentially V dot. Um, But then, of course, how do we prove that this is zero? Well, that's what the next slide is for. So we, we're, we're, we're going to prove this to be proved, right? Because uh, it's not obvious from this slide. So what do we do then? We, we take this expression and we bring in the uh, expression for acceleration, which, uh, is that still on my clipboard here somewhere? Yeah, so we'll then take this expression and plug it in here. That's what we're going to do. So there's that expression, right, from the clipboard. Right, there it is. Right, same expression, just to double check. And I can erase that. Uh, <clears throat> so what we do then is we have this uh, expression. So this is uh, h dot from the previous slide. And now we plug in this expression for ri double dot. So ri double dot, of course, is its own summation, right? We can, again, want to get one of these double summation terms. Um, so we get, of course, remember, right, this is a summation. And remember that r cross uh, v1 plus v2, right, does have that distributive property, or uh, distributive property which is r cross v1 plus r cross v2. And so uh, when we plug in here this summation, that's just a big plus, a lot of pluses, uh, this cross term is going to distribute on all of those pluses. So we can pull the summation out of this term and bring it back over here. All right, so we have a double summation and a bunch of terms ri cross rij. So mi. Uh, M MI was already there, we added the MI MJ here. So we have this, again, this uh, MI MJ term showing up here, and we have this RIJ here term as well. Now, if we look at this, of we're going to apply a similar argument to what we used in the conservation of linear momentum, but it's a little bit more complicated. Uh, so, specifically, uh, first, we're going to look at that rij, and we're going to expand that out, right? So that's rj minus ri vector. All right, so we're going to plug that in here. So this term here becomes ri cross rj minus ri. And then we're going to remember, of course, that ri, right, this distributes, and that ri cross ri is zero, right? So that's r i cross r j minus r i cross r i and that term goes to zero so we're left over with just r i cross r r j so we can simplify this r i j to just just the r j part right now what we've got here right uh, let's see is this summation at this point so we have h dot is equal to the sum, which we simplified out uh, using rij. And then we drop the, uh, the, the j term, uh, the i term. And then we just have a summation over mi, mj, rij, and ri cross rj. Now, this looks remarkably similar to the expression for L dot for angular linear momentum, where the only difference was if in linear momentum, right, this was Rij, the vector. Right? Now it's Ri cross Rj. Uh, however, if you remember, what allowed us to say that this summation is zero in the case of linear momentum was the observation that Rij equals the negative of Rji. Right. Likewise, for cross products, fortunately or unfortunately in, in some sense, um, the cross R cross V is the negative of V cross R for any vectors R and V. And so if we reverse the order of this, we get negative Ri 
cross rj. And so again, it's a summation over all i's and all j's. And if we look at this expression for every i comma j term, right, uh, if we look at, there, there, there will be an equal rj, R, j column i term. So for every, right, mi, mj term with ri cross rj over rij cubed, there's an, another term, which is mj, mi over r j i cubed r j cross r i. And now if we simplify this term, right, for, so for every one of these, there's one of these. And so if we simplify this term, well, the order of these multiplication doesn't matter. Again, m i, m j. Uh, the magnitude of r j i is equal to the magnitude of r i j. So we can swap that. And then r j cross r i is equal to the negative sign, add a negative sign there, of r i cross r j. Right? So for every term in this summation, we, for every one of these terms, we have one of these terms, which is equal and opposite to the original one of these terms. And so for every expression in this summation, there's a term which cancels it out. It's equal and opposite. And so when we sum over L, all the i's and all the j's, uh, every term has its pair, which cancels each other out, and they're all sum up to zero. So the angular momentum, then, of a sum of particles under the influence of gravity is equal to zero. Okay. And here's uh, some more explanations of that. So what that means is that uh, there's an invariant plane, basically. There is, uh, we conclude that the angular momentum of um, the system of, bot of bodies, whether it's the, the planets in the solar system, all the stars in the galactic plane, or even just the Earth-Moon uh, system, or even the Earth-Moon-Sun system, right? There is a invariant quantity called angular momentum, actually three invariant quantities, right? There are three components, three Ds, three converse, conserved quantities there. Uh, notice that we didn't show that the second derivative is zero, but obviously if the first derivative is zero, the second derivative is also zero. Okay. So what does this tell us? Take a step back. What does this tell us? This tells us that there's a, what, what does this tell us, this constant? It tells us there's a constant direction. What is, the, what is the thing that we can physically measure out of this angular momentum? Nothing. The thing that we can physically measure is the, the direction of that. I mean, the, the, we can't actually, I mean, we can't visualize the magnitude of the angular momentum. I mean, maybe it's how fast things are whirring around, but really that's not, not very helpful. What it tells us is a direction. In a particular, in the uh, galactic case, there's a direction perpendicular to the galactic plane. And uh, in the solar system, there's a direction perpendicular to what's called the ecliptic plane, which is the sort of uh, plane which all the uh, particles move in, or planets in that case. Now, in general, right, this tells us one thing that direction is constant, that we can navigate a little bit, right? There's some orientation in space uh, determined by the overall angular momentum vector, which is extremely convenient, right? That's a very good reference uh, for determining direction. Um, now, of course, right, a vector, vectors and planes are, um, are equivalent, right? So for every vector, there's a plane of position vectors which are perpendicular to that plane, right? or to that vector, right? So for every vector, there's a whole plane of positions which is, is perpendicular to that plane. Um, so what does that tell us? Well, it tells us that, in a sense, we've reduced the complexity of our system, that there's a 
um, a single uh, direction. We can measure everything with respect. Now, does that mean that like the position vectors of all the points have to be in that plane? No, I shouldn't. I'm not going to go that far. So here's our angular momentum vector. Right? That doesn't mean like our all our plans have to lie in that plane, right? Right. So we may have one planet here and one planet here. Uh, and so they, they're not necessarily have to lie in the plane. And in fact, all the planets are slightly inclined with respect to the ecliptic. Uh, so actually, if we go back to the uh, first slide, let's see, I'll just remember which slide we're on. Uh, so in this case, the ecliptic is that center of the zodiac. So the angular momentum vector defines the perpendicular to the ecliptic plane. And actually, Mercury, you see, is going above and below that plane. So it, it moves around with respect to that plane a little bit. Right? But remember, that plane here is for the solar system. Right? The ecliptic plane is for the, is the angular momentum vector of the solar system. Uh, where, so the, when, when, the, when Mercury is going above that one, uh, presumably, there's some other planet which is going below that one, right? So this may be Mars or something like that. So it's sort of the average of these angular momentums, uh, not individual planets. Right. Over time, however, it seems that uh, it's just a natural law that things damp out, uh, that motions above and below the, the ecliptic plane damp out, and so that more or less the motions of all the planets now lie in this ecliptic plane, and they're all going the same direction as well. In theory, right, you could have a, plan a planet going the opposite direction, right, and that, that's certainly plausible. Uh, but over I didn't get that. Could you try again? Oh, sorry, Siri is bothering me. Uh, but over time, uh, that, has, that motion has been damped out. Likewise, in the galactic planes, the, uh, the motions of the arms of the uh, Milky Way galaxy are all moving sort of in the same direction and they are more or less restricted to a plane. Right? So again, right, doesn't tell us everything, but tells us quite a bit about the motion, uh, reduces our number of variables to the system uh, substantially, and especially in, say, a two-body system, uh, it reduces them by three. Right? So we, remember, in a two-body system, there's actually only six variables, uh, rij and rij dot. And now, in the two-body system, we've eliminated three of those variables. Oops, too many dots. Okay. So sixed off, and now we've eliminated three of those variables. So here, I'll just uh, make a nice illustration of, uh, this is from, um, uh, what is this from? This is from uh, this is from uh, Universe Sandbox, right? So it's one of their standard demos. Right? So what we've got here, right, are two angular momentum vectors, right? I can't draw them here, but I can sort of indicate them. Uh, actually, I can't. So there's one angular momentum vector which is pointing up here, and another angular momentum vector which is, uh, I think they'll put it on its side, pointing like that. Uh, and of course, they're weighted by the relative magnitudes of their angular momentums. But when these two systems of bodies collide, what you'll see is that, so you can think this is the Milky Way and this is the Andromeda galaxy. When they collide, that angular momentum vector. Right, the sum of those two angular momentum vectors will be conserved. So what does that sum look like? It's going to look like something like that. So after they collide, when things settle down, eventually you'll hopefully be able to see it a little bit. Uh, that that uh, they, this, uh, minus the bodies which escape, by the way, we'll talk about that in a second, minus the bodies that should form a new plane, uh, and that plane should have an angular momentum vector looking like that, and so it should be oriented more or less like that. And we can sort of see that coming together. Of course, it's three-dimensional, so it's hard to visualize a little bit. Okay. So in there, sort of forming an angular momentum vector looks like that, and a new double galactic plane, which looks like this. Now, 
Note, however, that this angular momentum vector apply is a sum of the angular momentum of all of the all of the bodies, including those bodies which escape the gravity well of this double collision thing going on. And so there may be some particles here, here which uh, which escape the entire system yet are still contributing to the angular momentum. And so they won't be uh, so the actual angular momentum vector of the reduced galaxy may be smaller than the angular momentum vector um, than the one we saw there. Or maybe maybe it'll be smaller and it'll be uh, maybe slightly differently oriented depending on which direction those escape particles go. Okay, so there may be uh, part star systems which is, have escaped this, this end body problem. So each of those has a well-defined angular momentum vector and after a few billion years Right, the it'll the, the combined galaxy will come back come and converge to a new angular momentum vector with a new galactic plane, uh, which is a sum of those two minus the pieces which which escaped. Okay, so that's angular momentum. Now we move on to energy. Um, energy is actually a little bit easier, I think, in a way than angular momentum, uh, but it's harder to visualize. Right, angular momentum has this nice plain, easy to, it's easy to tell what the angular momentum vector of the solar system is just by looking at it. Uh, it's that if all the plan, planets are moving in a plane, then it's easy to see what's the angular momentum vector is just a vector perpendicular to that plane. Don't know the magnitude, but the direction. Um, energy is harder to visualize. Uh, we'll talk about visualization techniques in a little bit, but it's, it's harder to visualize. Uh, because it's sort of, in a way, energy is a fictitious quantity in, in a certain sense. Um, even kinetic energy is a fictitious quantity. Um, although there are certain theories of thermodynamics, right, which you can say, right, there's energy, uh, which is equivalent to heat. But uh, anyway, so there are no many notions of energy, things which are conserved. Um, so generally speaking, we talk about energy as something which uh, is measurable and is conserved in a, in a certain sense. Um, well, we'll talk about that in a bit, but our, con our general notion that we consider of kinetic energy or, or of energy of kinetic energy of a particle is um, one half mv squared, right? There's lots of good physical reasons we use that number. Uh, it may not be applicable in all circumstances, but it's, uh, it's pretty universal, right? One half mv squared. So, of course, in our system of particles, we have lots of them, right? So, uh, do I still have that on my clipboard? Uh, no, I don't have that on my clipboard. Um, so, I'll go back and fetch it. Yeah, this is one. So the uh, kinetic energy of a particle, right, is uh, the uh, one half m. Now magnitude of v i squared, m i squared, which is of course one half m i v i transpose v. Oops, sorry, got ahead of myself. V i, uh, and of course v i is one half m i r dot i transpose r dot i. So that's <coughs> our, our standard expression for uh, kinetic energy, one half mv squared. So if we add the total energy of the system of particles, right, it's just the sum of the individual kinetic energies of each of the particles. So we get a summation, one half mv squared summed over all the particles, total, ener total kinetic energy of the system. Is kinetic energy conserved? No, kinetic energy is not conserved, right? I mean, it's obvious to see, right? If you have an, uh, the Earth, for example, and you have a spacecraft which isn't moving, right? So V equals zero, what's gonna happen to it? Well, okay, 
let me uh, put it another way, right? What happens if I uh, take this uh, pen and I, it has no velocity, I drop it, oh, it, it, sorry, I just lost it. Uh, it. It acquired kinetic energy, right? Kinetic energy in our system is not going to be conserved. Uh, so that's a problem because we're trying to divine invariance, right? Um, so what's our solution to that? Well, our solution to that is to define a fictitious energy, which is we call it potential energy. Uh, in particular, uh, potential energy of gravity. So when I, if I think about my pen, when I'm dropping it, I probably can't even see it because my zoom thing is doing it. Right, I drop my, uh, I don't want to drop my coffee cup, that's a bad idea. Or I'll drop my thing, right? So the, the potential energy, so if you have zero kinetic energy, the potential energy is the velocity of this uh, T cozy. Uh, when it gets to the center of the Earth, basically. Um, so it's it, the potential energy of this T cozy is the energy that it will acquire, the kinetic energy it will acquire when it hits the bottom of the Earth. Sort of, right? Unfortunately, however, we can't really define potential energy that way. Um, why can't we? Well, because there's no absolute zero of uh, the potential energy, right? So if we, uh, if, if we just take the force due to gravity, right? If you remember what the force due to gravity, F equals m1, m2, divided by r1, 2, uh, well, rij squared. The problem with that is that if, say, I drop my T cozy uh, to, towards, a, towards the Earth, uh, when it gets very close to the center of the Earth, right, then Rij equals zero. And we plug zero into this expression, and so the force will be infinite. And so it will accelerate infinitely fast, right? When my T cozy gets to the center of the Earth, so it will accelerate in infinitely fast. Um, and so, hence the kinetic energy when it gets to the center of the Earth will be infinitely fast. Now, you may think that doesn't make much sense, and it doesn't make much sense because the law of gravitation fails once you get below the surface of the Earth, right? So it will never actually become infinitely fast because it'll, it'll bump into the floor, right? So, okay, that's a problem. But it's theoretically a problem because this is our model of gravity that we use, and the model of gravity works very well when you're outside the surface of the Earth, but it fails once you get below the surface of the Earth. Um, but nevertheless, it's our, it's our model of gravity. And so if we were to define kinetic energy, uh, the, the kinetic energy that a particle would, uh, potential energy is the kinetic energy that a particle would achieve when it got to the center of the Earth, it would be infinite, right? And so that's a problem. Um, so, we, that, so this is why we actually define potential energy in a negative sense. So potential energy is negative. That's why we have the negative sign there. Um, so potential energy can never be positive. You can never have positive potential energy. Uh, so, okay, that I guess kind of makes sense. So what is, it, what is this all me measured relative to? Well, the problem is potential energy is actually chosen in a way uh, that it's just the energy which can be picked up and turned into content kinetic energy. So, so more, more to put a, a, a finer point on it, kinetic energy is defined as the thing when you add it to kinetic energy is conserved, right? So it's the we define it to be the thing when you take the derivative of it and the derivative of kinetic energy, the derivative is zero. So in fact, in a way. Um, Right, if you actually follow a different approach to this derivation in Prussing and Conway, uh, that's how actually he calculates it, or they calculate it, is uh, they, they find the derivative of kinetic energy and say, well, that's potential energy, and then show that it can be calculated as a function of position. Um, we're going to go through it the opposite way. We're just going to define it to be uh, this, and then we'll, we'll show that it's conserved. But there's no reason it should be this. 
just looking at, you know, trying to in intuit what it is, like as a physical thing. There's no physical interpretation to this other than the derivative of kinetic energy is equal to the derivative of this. Right. Well, that said, okay, let's take a, take a brief look at what this is. Um, so basically, it's uh, if we have all these particles here, the kinetic energy, uh, the potential energy of particle I due to particle J is the product of the masses uh, divided by the distance between them. Right. So as the distance between this them gets larger. Uh, this term will go to infinity, and uh, as they get infinitely far apart, uh, this goes to zero. So lim as r goes to infinity, uh, v equals zero. All right. So potential energy can never be greater than zero, right? This negative sign can never reverse. And actually, when these two particles get infinitely close together, potential energy becomes infinitely negative. And so you get these things like gravity wells, right, uh, that we define. And actually, there's no bottom to these gravity wells uh, when we map them out. Of course, once you get, there's, there's a limit to this. This is a planet Earth, right? Uh, so in theory, right, the, infinite, the well goes infinitely far down. Uh, but in fact, this is zero here. But in fact, when we get to the surface of the Earth, it has to stop because we hit the surface of the Earth. We create a little bit. And all that kinetic energy becomes very warm. All right. Uh, so that's sort of illustrated here, right? Here's some here's some potential wells due to the moon, uh, due to the Earth, right? And we have v equals zero here, and so this is getting negative. Okay. And in theory, this goes infinitely far down, but of course, once you get to the surface of the Earth, it gets capped off at a potential uh, v of the surface of the Earth, right? I forget actually what the potential energy at the surface of the Earth is. Uh, but it, it's relatively easy to calculate. All right. So um, we'll show, just because that's how we've defined it, uh, that when we calculate the total energy, the potential plus the kinetic energy, uh, that that is a are going to be a fourth constant. So actually, this is a this is actually a scalar quantity. Remember, both of these are scalars. So it's actually only going to give us one more invariant. All right. So how's the calculation go? All right. So first of all, we'll calculate the derivative of kinetic energy. Well, how do we do that? Uh, so we uh, take the definition of kinetic energy, right, uh, which is on the previous slide. Based, right, there's our definition of kinetic energy. Differentiate it, right? Uh, use the chain rule, right? Uh, so equals uh, one half m i r i double dot transpose r plus one half m i r sorry r dot one dot transpose r double dot. And so these two terms are the same, and so the one half disappears, and we just get m i. R, and I forget which side we used it, ri dot transpose ri double dot. And so we get this term right here. So the one half has disappeared because there are two versions of this. Uh, then we plug in our expression for uh, acceleration, which I guess I won't bother to uh, go dig out from the previous slide because it's a few slides back. Uh, but you can remember it is, uh, remember the rij term, uh, the sum over j, the mj here, and this uh, denominator, right? So those, what that's what, that's where that goes. So okay, well, now we have an expression for the der derivative of kinetic energy. It's complicated. It's like uh, not very useful, uh, and it's definitely not zero. Not equal to zero. Um, and so basically what we're going to show is that the derivative of potential energy is also exactly the same equal to this. And we'll show that that's equal to the negative of the derivative of potential energy. Uh, so in the previous slide we showed this, and now we're going to show that 
uh, v dot is equal to negative t dot. So equal to the negative of this. Uh, so remember our definition of potential energy. This is our definition of potential energy with the negative sign over there, right? And so we just differentiate that. Well, okay, how do we do that? Um, <clears throat> so first of all, we're like, all of these, none of these terms are time varying except for this one. So this is a T. So we'll just uh, look at that term in particular. So what is that term? Well, that's Rij transpose Rij uh, two. So that's this one is Rij squared, and so we take the square root of that. Right. So we want to differentiate that. So let's put it in sort of something that looks more familiar with the, this, with our chain rule, uh, which is d dt of Rij transpose Rij to the negative one half. Right. So we can differentiate that. So now we apply the chain rule to this. So that's equal the negative one half comes down, uh, and then we get Rij transpose Rij. And remember, this exponent increases to negative three halves, uh, and then we have the in the, the the derivative of this term, which is Rij dot transpose Rij plus Rij transpose Rij dot. Right. <clears throat> so we've got uh, those two terms. They're the same term, however, so we can just simplify that as equal to negative of Rij. So there's two of those that cancels the two over here. Uh, transpose Rij. And actually, we can, uh, we can simplify this term as well as one over um, Rij cubed uh, magnitude there. <clears throat> so, and then this term is Rij dot transpose Rij. Right. And so, uh, let's see what it is. I think that's what we've done here. Uh, there's the three halves come down to there. And we get those two terms. The one halves cancel, uh, but uh, we already had a one half term here somewhere. Um, so yes, uh, so those those two terms uh, cancel that new one half, but there was already a one half, and so we still have a one half here. So we 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 doubled, but we also had a negative another one half, and so we're left with one one half. Okay, so this is what we have now. Uh, we can think of it as three halves, or just this term. Um, and now what we need to do is look at uh, this expression here. So this is, of course, equal to this term here is equal to uh, rj dot minus ri dot transpose rij. Okay. So okay, now what do we do? Right. So first of all, um, we can expand this expression a little bit. So, uh, right. Oh, sorry. Right. And now, um, as explained on the pre next slide, um, this term here, right, is equal to um, the negative of this term here. And uh, so each term in this expression is canceled by a term in this expression. So if we go back here, um, we can expand this out here. R dot j transpose r i j minus r dot i r i j. And now we're going to take that expression and, well, say that's equal to plus r i r j i, right? So if we look at these two expressions, for every one of these, uh, so every i and j in here, right, this term becomes, if by using the same 
structure as in the previous two proofs, right? Every term r i r dot i j, there's a term r dot j i. i and j are the same. I, this term is the same. This term is the same. So for every one of these terms, right, there's one of these two terms. And so the, since these two are uh, the same, modulo uh, the, the name of the index, we can just double them up, and hence we drop the two, and we in fact only need uh, the first term, or the second term, depending on which you're using. In this case, we have a negative sign, so we're using the second term. Right. So, in the end, right, if we, uh, once we've uh, shown that, right, these two terms, uh, this term is equal to this term, and it's negative, um, right, we can get, we, we show, right, that now v dot is equal to negative of this term, and this term is precisely equal to t dot. And so when we add the two together, right, uh, t dot plus v dot equals t dot plus negative t dot, which of course is equal to zero. So of course, where we chose to construct our potential energy in such a way that this would happen. This is not an accident. Um, as I said, Prussing and Conway uh, go the other direction. They sort of like take this term and then move in the other direction. But uh, again, in a, so in a certain sense, potential energy is fictitious. Uh, but in a certain sense, it's real because the motion, it, it represents uh, the potential of kinetic energy once you reach sort of a certain point in space. In any case, it gives us uh, a number which we will use as the total energy of a spacecraft or a planet or whatever it is, uh, which we call E4, and we'll just generally denote it as E uh, for the combination of kinetic and potential energy. So that gives us our, well... I don't know, we have lots of invariants. We have uh, really six invariants for linear momentum, right? Uh, position, initial position, and uh, velocity. We have three invariants for angular momentum, and now we have one more invariant for energy. So lots of invariants. Okay. Unfortunately, uh, in n-body problem, that's about as far as we can go. Um, so here's just a, an illustration of the gravity wells, uh, this potential energy, uh, as you move around in this gravity well, you will uh, lose potential energy, but you'll gain that energy back in the form of kinetic energy. And so here's just a uh, illustration of the potential energy wells of the solar system. So it's not moving very fast. Right. So here we've got, uh, right, this is the sun, I think. I don't know where this is. Um, so at some point, we cut off this potential energy well at the surface of the Earth. And in order to get outside, to move our position uh, from that surface of the Earth out into this overall plane, right, out beyond the potential well of the Earth, we need to, that energy has to come from somewhere. And the only way we have to get that energy is kinetic energy. So and the only, only way to escape the surface of the Earth right, is to give ourselves sufficient kinetic energy so that the point, by the point we get here, where we've, uh, we've sort of gained all sorts of potential energy, uh, how do we, that potential energy has come in the form from our kinetic energy. And so as the trade-offs, we move from here to here, we're trading off that kinetic energy. It's moving into potential. And the only way we can get here is by having that kinetic energy, which we trade into potential. Because in order to get to this point, you need that uh, potential energy. Right? You need the potential energy of that point. Um, which brings up, actually, a point which I didn't make which is uh, important, which is that this is a conservative field in that the sense that the potential energy only depends on position, right? It doesn't depend on anything else. So it's a, the, the, the energy of this, there's an energy associated with that point, right? Which is energy in a real sense, uh, a certain sense, or need, uh, energy you need to get to that point. So there's essentially energy associated with that point. And once your total energy becomes positive, right, you can basically get anywhere in the solar system, but there's sort of a price to pay associated with that position, which uh, you, you end up paying in the form of kinetic.
kinetic energy. All right. So that uh, brings up brings me to the end of uh, yes the n body problem. Basically, anything we can say about the n body problem we've said. And so when we come back in part B, uh, we will be talking about the two body problem and uh, uh, deriving expressions for the two body problem, which we'll then use in the subsequent lecture to derive the orbital elements and the geometric invariance of motion. So I'll see you all then.